Today we're going to be talking about a problem that is facing healthcare that we really need the help of legislators and private industry to work together to solve. And today I'm here with uh, Dr. Tom Agresta from the University of Connecticut. Uh, Tom, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? So, um, Phil, I'm a, a family physician and a long-term educator at the University of Connecticut in the Department of Family Medicine. And I also have a background in clinical informatics. And so I do everything from full spectrum family medicine to um, help work on uh, solving electronic health record issues in our own setting, as well as uh, work with our state um, on health information exchange issues. Okay. And I understand you have a problem in the state with medications as we do everywhere in the United States. So how are you approaching that working with your local government to uh, address it? So we're, we've got an interesting opportunity. Um, our state legislature um, actually uh, held some hearings uh, a while back on the problem of sort of uh, polypharmacy and uh, medication reconciliation. We had held a um, series of uh, events in the, in the past and the legislature kind of brought us forward and we, we were able to sort of talk with them about the issues. And then they actually asked for a group to be formed under the Health IT Advisory Committee of the state um, called the Medication Reconciliation Polypharmacy Group. And so we've got an, we, we have a short term name for it, it's a MRP. And so we've got this group together of um, experts in um, clinical medicine, pharmacy, um, health IT, um, patient advocacy, who are really trying to kind of understand the problem better and uh, derive some solutions for uh, recommending for both funding at the state level as well as collaboration in uh, public-private uh, uh, partnerships. Okay, so why don't you explain to us what medication reconciliation actually means? So there's a lot of different ways of kind of describing it, but probably one of the most uh, effective ways is to think about the process by which um, clinicians and patients agree upon the medications that they're actually taking um, and that are actually being prescribed for them um, from perhaps multiple different providers. So many, you know, sometimes it's multiple different clinicians prescribing medicines. Um, coming up with a common list, coming up with a common um, set of definitions that both the patient and provider agree upon, and then actually reconciling it in whatever um, systems might uh, be appropriate for that uh, pairing. So it might be in an electronic health record, um, it might be in some other kind of electronic tool, it might actually be a paper-based uh, format for a patient. But basically, getting to agreement on what's actually being prescribed and taken, including over-the-counter um, uh, medications and uh, supplements. So we know that most medical error occur during times of transition of care. So med reconciliation is a process that during a transition of care, like entering the hospital, entering the emergency room, leaving the hospital, going from one doctor's office to another, that we want to make sure that we know exactly what medications the patient's on and what adjustments need to be made. But is it more than that, Tom? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> medication reconciliation is um, a nearly constant thing in a primary care setting. As you might imagine, every time a patient enters an office, they might well have been to visit another specialist. They may have um, started or stopped the medication on their own. They may have started a supplement on their own. Um, we may be um, de-prescribing or changing a medication based on um, the needs of a, of a patient. And so it really uh, should occur at every encounter um, with a patient. And, and for the patient and their family themselves, um, when they make alterations, they should actually be doing um, that and participating in the process of providing information back and forth to the providers. That seems pretty straightforward, but as you and I know, it doesn't happen very well. Um, it's very difficult because often the patients don't know what they're taking or the doctors may be misled to think they know what the patient's taking. So we have the problem of adherence, which is, is the patient really taking what they say they're taking? We have the problem of, of 
being listed on things that are no longer being taken. Um, duplicates, uh, such as a med that's called by their brand name as well as their generic name, and the patient doesn't know the difference between those two and thinks they're two different medicines. There's also the problem of medication equivalence, where two drugs do exactly the same thing, but to the patient, they're just two different pills. So what are some of the other issues that you see patients have with this whole medication reconciliation process? Well, I, you know, as, as you know, um, and it's no secret, uh, following um, a complex medication regime is really challenging. And so it's not just simply, um, you know, are, am I taking the exact medicines that the physician intends me to take, but am I taking them in the correct fashion? Um, you know, am I utilizing the medicine the way that um, was intended at the correct time of day before or after the use of um, eating? Um, and there's a whole host of things that go into sort of good medication adherence that are far more challenging than simply um, am I on, you know, pill X um, at the right dose, taking it um, for the right purpose. Um, and so there's that element. And then you know, there's the element of, um, you know, taking uh, uh, patients often will take medication that a family member has offered them, you know, um, here, it works for me and it works for this problem, you know, try pill Y, you know, because it may help your back, it just like it helps my back, you know, so there's a lot of issues that go into sort of um, safely taking uh, medications. Okay, and what explain your definition of polypharmacy? Polypharmacy um, is, I would say, basically when a patient is taking medications um, that uh, maybe for appropriate purposes, but they are starting to overlap with each other in terms of making the patient at risk. Um, some people will say it's five or more drugs. Um, you know, but I would venture to say that there are many elderly individuals who are on, you know, four or five medications that are appropriate, but when you start getting to 12 and 13 and 17 and 19 medicines, um, it's, there's no doubt that the, the regimen has become so complex and the interactions are way beyond um, a human to be able to kind of figure out that the patient gets at risk um, and they get at risk for taking the medications incorrectly, et cetera. So there's probably um, a real role for, um, you know, looking very carefully at people on four or five or more medications and determining whether they really truly need to be on all of them. Okay. Now, a lot of the safety organizations, Joint Commission, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, CMS, um, have really pushed medication reconciliation as being the solution. And most people have implemented it, but yet you and I see that it's not implemented very well. And what do you think is, are a couple of the big reasons that we're not being successful, even though we're going through the motions of doing med medication reconciliation, we're not really being successful? Well, I think there are a couple of different uh, challenges. Some of them relate to um, the actual time and effort required, so the workflow required um, to actually do medication reconciliation, um, to do it well um, in someone who is uh, taking a number of different medications or has, you know, maybe English as a second language or doesn't understand their meds, really takes a substantial amount of time. And to to um, do it well also requires um, enough knowledge about the medications that often um, we have you know, staff trying to, to do it who are um, not as well equipped to perhaps uh, get all the information um, as might be required. So that's, the, that's one element of the workflow. The other is that our electronic health records, while they are required to permit us to do um, med rec for the purposes of meaningful use and they allow us to sort of track that, it doesn't make it easy to do medication reconciliation. Um, often patients have medicines that are present in multiple different electronic health records because they see different providers across a region um, and those records may and may not share electronically um, some of the medications um, with each other and it may be um, provided in a format that is 
very confusing or hard to actually integrate into your electronic health record correctly. Um, and then you may find that even if you integrate it in it correctly, um, it doesn't transmit or send that information to the other individual's electronic health record. So they're not being helped to have things updated. Um, you know, those are some of the, the challenges. The other thing is that when um, providers um, now cancel a prescription, they may cancel it inside their electronic health record and not have that prescription canceled at the pharmacy electronically, even though that's plausible and possible, um, it may not occur. Um, and therefore, it may remain on the patient's medication list in other places and therefore inadvertently get re um, introduced to a patient, um, even though it's not intended to. Okay. So what are you hoping to happen this year? So in Connecticut, my, my hope is that um, our, our medication reconciliation polypharmacy group or our MRP group um, will help define in a much more substantial way what the challenges and the problems are. Um, and we'll come up with some um, recommendations that, that can be um, enacted um, in, a, in a several different ways. One, we may come up with some policy recommendations, um, perhaps maybe even having a, um, a centralized location where um, medication uh, information can be stored and made available to all the providers, perhaps um, you know, more on the policy side of, of how to have this occur or what might need to occur. Um, and then the other is to actually start to begin to experiment with um, ways to improve that in electronic health records, in the workflow of the providers. And I'd also like to see it improved in the workflow of the patients and their family members. Um, so maybe some tools or some experimental, some pilots, things like that, that um, can be occurring. Um, and then the third is really to seek some funding, um, you know, through uh, several different sources to try and make this process easier so that we actually start to go towards um, both process, policy, workflow, and health IT solutions. Okay. Well, you, you know that uh, in my book on MedRec, I calculated that it takes about 32,000 full-time equivalents to do med rec each year in the United States. Do you think that's a valid number? Um, well, I suspect you probably are underestimating. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and that's, that's, to, that's to do it um, at the, uh, in the current state of affairs, which is still not, not an ideal state of affairs. Yeah, so I think there's a huge um, drag on the system because we're not doing it well, it's been kind of become the de facto standard and we haven't been talking about it very much. Uh, we've kind of moved on from it and it represents about $3.8 billion a year in expense and, and not that successful. So I'm very excited that the state of Connecticut is moving forward, uh, that their legislators, that your legislators have uh, the foresight to put some effort into this. I think it's going to help with the opioid crisis as well. Mm -hmm. as we identify people that are overusing medications, especially medications that interact with other things. We're having, I saw that last year we've had more deaths from prescription opioids than we have uh, during the whole Vietnam War and during the, uh, in yearly from automobile accidents. So no longer is the car the biggest killer, the prescription pad is. So we have to, uh, tackle this and I'm really looking forward to following you these uh, next few years and see what comes out of it. I hope we can make a difference. That's my desire as well. My desire is that, um, you know, step by step we solve, you know, perhaps pieces of it. I, I think that, you know, this will be a stepwise um, challenge. And if we can, like I, like I say, to our group, if we can just at least allow, allow ourselves to cancel prescriptions electronically and know that that works, then I think we've made a step. And then if we can, you know, at least, um, you know, enhance the way that uh, a provider is able to sort of integrate um, information from other systems in a much more seamless and sort of um, user-friendly way, then I think we've made a step forward. So I think it's going to be a series of steps 
with a sort of long-term goal is my, my belief. Okay. And is LinkedIn a good way for people to reach out to you? Yes, they certainly can reach out to me through LinkedIn. Okay. And I hope uh, people take the opportunity to download our free book on MedRec, that's spelled W-R-E-C-K, that really explains med reconciliation and the impact that it has on our economy and the opportunity that you're working on to create a single source of truth in the state of Connecticut so that we can solve this problem together. So very excited that you spent some time with me to, uh, today, Tom, and look forward to future conversations on this topic. Absolutely.